my husband at the window upstairs. My husband up there, upstairs. Oh, let me pass, please. What am I to do? I bring police. Distraught at the mysterious disappearance of her husband, Mrs. Neville Sinclair turned to my friend Sherlock Holmes for help. Uh, my name is Watson, Dr. Watson, and I was privileged to share the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. I will tell you about the man with the twisted lip. If I may consult my notes a moment... Isaac Whitney, brother of the late Elias Whitney, D.D., principal of the Theological College of St. George's, was much addicted to opium. Having read De Quincey at college, he had drenched his tobacco with laudanum in an attempt to produce the same effects. As so many more have done, he found that the practice is easier to attain than to get rid of. One night, it was in June 1889, about the hour when a man gives his first yawn, there came a ring at me bell. Now, who can that be? Why, it's Kate Whitney. Oh, Dr. Watson, uh, you will excuse my calling so late on you and Mary. I do so want a little help. You see, it's about Isa. He has not been home for two days. Dr. Watson, this isn't the first time I've come to you about my husband's... his trouble. Uh, Lately, from time to time, I know he's been going to a place in the east end of the city, Upper Swandham Lane. The Bar of Gold, it's called. Then he must be rescued. Yes, but how can I go to such a place and get him away? Tell me how, Doctor, and I'll go at once. You shall stay here. I shall go. Oh, but, Doctor, Mrs. Watson, I didn't Not mean... another word, my dear lady. If your husband is at the Bar of Gold, you shall have him with you within the hour. Come to fetch you out of this place. What? Well, what time is it? It is uh, nearly eleven o'clock on Friday, June the nineteenth. Friday? Good heavens! I thought it was Wednesday. It is Wednesday. What do you want to frighten the chap for? I tell you, it's Friday, and your poor wife has been waiting these two days for you. You should be ashamed of yourself. So I am. But you've got mixed, Watson, for I've been here only a few hours. Uh, three pipes, uh, four pipes, I, I, I forget how many. But I'll go home with you. I wouldn't frighten Kate, poor little Kate. I, I don't understand. I have a cab waiting outside. Now, can I get up? I, uh, I think so. Good. Now then. Well, Watson, I must owe them something. Be a good chap. Find out how much I'll just... Sit here till you come back. Here, look where you're treaded. Let me pass, if you please. What? Speak as low as you can. I have excellent ears. Holmes. What on earth are you doing in this den and in such a disguise? If you can get rid of your sottish friend, I should be glad of a little talk with you. I don't care about sir. Then send him home in it. I should also send a note by the cabin to your wife to say that you've thrown in your lot with me. If you'll wait outside, I'll be with you in five minutes. Uh. I suppose, my dear Watson, that you imagine I have added opium smoking to cocaine injections and all the other little weaknesses on which you favored me with your medical views? Well, I was certainly surprised to find you there. No more so than I to find you. I came to find a friend. And I to find an enemy. An enemy? Or shall I say my natural prey? Briefly, Watson, I'm in the midst of a remarkable inquiry. I had hoped to find a clue in the incoherent ramblings of those sots as I've done before now. Had I been recognized, my life wouldn't have been worth an hour's purchase. We should be rich men if we had a thousand pounds for every poor devil who'd been done to death in that den. It's the vilest murder trap on the whole riverside. And I fear Neville Sinclair has entered it never to leave it more. Ah, but our trap is here. You'll come with me, Watson. Well, I can be of use. A trusty comrade is always of use. 
And a chronicler still more so. <laughs> Fortunately, my room at the Cedars has two beds. <laughs> Mr. Sinclair's house in Kent. I'm staying there while I conduct the inquiry. Now, jump up, Watson. <laughs> All right, John. We shan't need you. I'll take that. Yes, John. Look out for me tomorrow, about 11. Very good, sir. Off we go, then. I shall just have time to tell you the facts before we get there. It seems absurdly simple, but somehow I can get nothing to go on. Maybe you may see us fast. Uh-huh. Proceed, then. Mr. Neville Sinclair is now 37 years of age, a man of temperate habits, a good husband, an affectionate father of two children, a man who's popular with all who know him. He has no occupation, but an interest in several companies. He goes into town, as a rule, every morning and returns by the 514 from Cannon Street every night. Last Monday, he went into town as usual and promised to bring home a box of bricks for his little boy. After he'd gone, his wife chanced to receive a telegram saying that a parcel of considerable value she'd been awaiting had arrived at the offices of the Aberdeen Shipping Company. So she went into town, had her lunch, and went to collect it. Well, that's near where we were tonight, isn't it? Um, Fresno Street, branching out of Upper Swandam Lane. You're well up in your London, I see, Watson. <laughs> Mrs. Sinclair got her parcel and found herself exactly at 4.35, walking through Swandham Lane on her way back to the station. Have you followed me so far? It's very clear. Now, if you remember, Monday was an exceedingly hot day. Mrs. Sinclair walked slowly, glancing about in the hope of seeing a cab. And suddenly, she was struck cold to hear a cry and to see her husband looking down at her from a second-floor window. She describes him as being extremely agitated. He then vanished from the window suddenly, as though he'd been pulled back from behind. Neville! Oh! Hangs up. I want to come in, please. My husband... At the window upstairs. Oh, my husband. Up there. Upstairs. Oh, let me pass, please. Please. Is there any hang, sir? Is there any hang? I don't understand. Oh, what am I to do? I bring policemen. Understand? This next corner, Well, ma'am, you were lucky I picked Swandham Lane to show these new constables their duty, or you might have had a fair step looking for an officer. Now, you're sure it was your husband you saw? I saw his face distinctly. It was agitated. He seemed to be beckoning. Then he vanished suddenly. Vanished? As though he'd been pulled back from behind. Then I ran to the door and tried to get inside. Only this foreign man... A foreigner, eh? What kind? An Indian, I think. He couldn't speak any English, so I couldn't... Look, Inspector. There's the place. Oh, it is, is it? <laughs> the good old bar of gold. An Indian who can't speak any English, did you say? Very convenient for him. Do you know something about him? We know all about that good-for-nothing Laska, ma'am. He can speak English all right when he wants to. Now, come on, you perisher, open up. Oh. Yes, you can owe. Out of the way now. I'm looking for this lady's husband. Uh, he is not here, Inspector. No one is being here just now. I don't know why. Wait, you have no permission to come in like this. It's a marmot, can I? I am calling one magistrate. Stow it, will you? We're going to take a look upstairs. Now, Evans, Parker, look lively and keep your eyes skinned. Right. Roger. You stay by me, ma'am. If he's here, we'll find him. He's gone through every inch of the place and there's not a sign. Only the Lasker and this fellow here. Mr. Bones, are you? I'm a respectable lodger. That's what I am. Why now I'm bursting into a man's room. I am calling magistrate. One more word out of you. Ah, come on, look. No, ma'am, I'm going to send one of these officers with you to get a cab while we ask a few questions. I'll join you directly. Uh, Parker! Oh, wait, Inspector. Look, on the table. Oh, what is it, ma'am? This box. See? 
the building block for our little boy. Pray continue your narrative, Holmes. Well, as a result of this, the rooms were carefully examined. Everything pointed to an abominable crime. Traces of blood were to be seen on the bedroom window still and on the floor. Thrust away behind a curtain in the front room were all Mr. Neville Sinclair's clothes, except his coat. There were no signs of violence on these things, and there was no other trace of Sinclair. Out of the window, he must have gone. This Lasker fellow, what about him? A man of the vilest antecedents. But as Mrs. Sinclair had met him at the foot of the stairs within a few seconds of seeing her husband at the window, he could hardly have been more than an accessory of the crime. His defense was absolute ignorance. No one? A cripple. His name is Hugh Boone, a professional beggar. Well, you've probably seen him. A little distance down Threadneedle Street. You could hardly pass without noticing him. Orange hair, a pale face with a bulldog chin, a pair of very penetrating dark eyes, and a horrible scar that has turned up the outer edge of his upper lip. Of course I've seen him. I distinctly remember wondering at the rain of charity he attracts. He, he seems to reap a harvest. Oh, he has his wit to thank as well as his appearance. So this is the lodger of the opium den. And the last man to see the gentleman of whom we're in quest. Oh, what could he have done single-handed against a man in the prime of life? He's a cripple and that he walks with a limp. But surely, Watson, your medical experience would tell you that weakness in one limb is often compensated for by exceptional strength in the others. Mm. Well, well, then what happened next? Mrs. Sinclair was escorted home. Boone was seized and searched, but there was nothing to incriminate him. It's true, there were some blood stains on his right shirt sleeve, but he pointed to a cut on his ring finger, which had been bleeding recently, and said he'd been near the windowsill and must have made the stains there. As to Mrs. Sinclair's story, he declared she must have been either dreaming or mad. Was he arrested? Yes. It might have been done sooner, for the few minutes delay at first when the room was being searched may have given him the chance to communicate with Alaska. And the river, has anything been found? When the tide ebbs, a mud bank under the window is exposed. But it wasn't Neville Sinclair they found there. What then? His coat. Only the coat? But yes, and what do you think they found in the pockets? I can't imagine. 421 that. pennies and 270 halfpennies. It's no wonder the tide hadn't swept it away. The, the, the body There's was... a fierce eddy in the channel between the wharf and the house. It seemed likely enough that the weighted coat had remained when the stripped body was sucked away into the river. Imagine what Boone might have done. He thrusts and fair out of the window. He hears the scuffle downstairs and knows he must get rid of the telltale clothes. He's in the act of throwing out the coat when he realizes that it will not sink. There's not a moment to lose. He rushes to the hoard where he keeps the fruits of his begging. He stuffs all the coins he can lay his hands on into the pockets of the coat and throws it out. Before he can do the same with the other things, there's a rush of steps below, and he only has time to close the window before the police appear. It certainly sounds feasible. It does. But I confess I cannot recall any case within my experience which looked so simple at the first glance and yet presents such difficulties. Ah, but see, Watson, we're on the outskirts of Lee. And there, you see, that light among the trees? Yes. Let's proceed. Yes. No good news, then? No. No bad? No. Well, thank God for that. This is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do, madam? How do you do? He has been of most vital use to me in several of my cases. A lucky chance has made it possible for me to associate him with this investigation. I am delighted to see you, Dr. Watson. You. I'm sure you'll forgive anything which may be wanting in our arrangements when you consider the blow which has come so suddenly. My dear madam, I'm an old campaigner, and if I were not... I can see very well that no apology is needed. Now, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I should very much like to ask you one or two plain questions, to which I beg a plain answer. Certainly, madam. Do not trouble about my feelings. I'm not hysterical or given to fainting. I simply wish to hear your opinion, your real opinion. Upon what point? In your heart of hearts, do you think that Neville is alive? Frankly, now. Frankly, then, madam, I do not. You think he is dead? I do. Murdered? I don't say that. 
Perhaps. And on what day did he meet his death? On Monday. Well, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, perhaps you will be good enough to explain how I have received this letter from him today. What? Yes, today. May I see it? Certainly. Ah, uh, coarse writing. Surely this is not your husband's man. No, but that in the enclosure is. Uh, I perceive that whoever addressed the envelope had to go and inquire as to the address. How can you tell that? The name, you see, is in perfectly black ink. It has dried itself. The rest is of the greyish color, which shows the blotting paper has been used. This man has written the name, and there's been a pause before he wrote the address. It can only mean he was not familiar with it. Of course, it's only a trifle, but there's nothing so important as trifles. Let us now see the letter. Aha, uh -huh. there's been an enclosure here. Yes, there was a ring. His signet ring. I see. And are you sure this is your husband's hand? Yes, when he wrote hurriedly. Dearest, do not be frightened. All will come well. There is a huge, huge error which it may take some little time to rectify. Wait in patience, Neville. Hmm. Written in pencil upon a flyleaf of a book of paper size. No watermark. Posted today in Gravesend by a man with a dirty thumb. Ah. Aha. The flap has been gummed. I'm not very much in error by a person who's been chewing tobacco. Well, Mrs. Sinclair, the clouds lighten, though I should not venture to say that the danger is over. But he must be alive. Unless this is a clever forgery to put us on the wrong scent. The ring, after all, proves nothing. It may have been taken from him. No. No. It is... It is his very own writing. Very well. It may, however, have been written on Monday and only posted today. That's possible. If so, much may have happened between. I can't imagine. It's unthinkable. On Monday, he made no remarks before leaving you? None. You were surprised to see him in Swandam Lane? Of course. Was the window open? Yes. Then he might have called you. He might. But he only gave an inarticulate cry. A call for help, I thought. He waved his hand. But it might have been surprise, astonishment at seeing you. It is possible. And you thought he was pulled back? Well, he disappeared so suddenly. He might have leapt back. You didn't see anyone else there? No, but that horrible man confessed to having been there. And the Lasker was at the foot of the stairs. So far as you noticed, your husband had his ordinary clothes on. But without his collar and tie, I distinctly saw his bare throat. Had he ever shown any signs of taking opium? Never. Thank you, Mrs. Sinclair. Those are the principal points about which I wish to be absolutely clear. We shall now have a little of this delightful supper and then retire. We may have a very busy day tomorrow. Watson, are you awake? Yes. Uh, Game from morning drive. What <coughs> a drive, oh yes, certainly. Then dress. Mm. I want to test a little theory of mine. I think you're now in the presence of one of the most absolute fools in Europe who deserves to be kicked from here to Charing Cross. But I think I have the key of the affair now. Where is this key? It was in the bathroom. Oh, oh yes, I'm not joking. I've just been there and I've taken it out. I have it in this Gladstone bag. Now, come on, Watson, and we shall see whether it will not fit the lock. Good morning, Mr. Holmes, sir. At who's on duty, Constable? Inspector Bradstreet, sir. Ah, Bradstreet, how are you? Well, Mr. Holmes, thank you. What brings you to Bow Street so early? I wish to have a word with you, Bradstreet. Oh, certainly, certainly. Uh, step into my room, gentlemen. Thank you. Now, I've called about that beggar man Boone, the Sinclair case. Yes, sir. Uh... He's been remanded for further inquiries. Is he here? In the cells. Is he quiet? Oh, he gives no trouble. He's a dirty scoundrel, though. Dirty? Yes, yeah, all we can do to make him wash his hands. His face is as black as a tinker's. Still, uh, once his case is settled, he'll have a regular prison bath, and if you saw him, I think you'd agree he needs it. I should like to see him very much. Well, come this way, then. Oh, uh, you'll leave your bag. No, no, I think I'll take it. Very good. Come along, then. The third on the right is his. Yeah, he's a beauty, isn't he? 
He certainly needs a wash. I had an idea he might, so I took the liberty of bringing the tools with me. Now then, if you'll have the goodness to open the door very quietly and let me get at his water jug with this sponge before he wakes up, we'll soon make him cut a much more respectable figure. Let me introduce you to Mr. Neville uh, Sinclair of Lee in the county of Kent. What? What? Well, you're right, Mr. Holmes. It is the missing man. I recognize him from his photograph. Well, it's all up then. Well, after 27 years in the force, I'll be... What do you say to this, sir? Say? Oh, yes. If I am Neville Sinclair... With what am I charged? With making away with Mr. Neville. No, hang it. I think it's obvious that no crime has been committed. Therefore, I'm illegally detained. No crime, Mr. Sinclair, but a very great error. You would have done better to have trusted your wife. God help me. It was the children. I can't bear to have them ashamed of their father. Now, listen to me. If you leave this to a court of law, you can hardly escape the publicity. On the other hand, if you can convince the police that there is no possible case against you... I see no reason why the details should find their way into the papers. Eh, hey, Bradstreet? Well, sir, I suppose... Then, gentlemen, you shall be the first ever to hear my story. After leaving school, I travelled a good deal. Then I took to the stage, and then I became a reporter on an evening newspaper in London. One day, my editor wanted a series of articles on begging in the metropolis. I volunteered to supply them. It was only by trying begging as an amateur that I could get the facts I needed. I made myself as pitiable as I could, a scar, a twisted lip, and then with a head of red hair, I took my station in the busiest part of the city. I applied my trade for seven hours. When I returned home in the evening, I found I'd received no less than 26 shillings and fourpence. I wrote my articles and thought a little more about it. Then, some time later, I, I backed a bill for a friend and had a writ served on me for 25 pounds. I was, I was, we were in and where, where to get the money until a sudden idea came to me, I... I begged a fortnight's grace from my creditor, got a holiday from my work and disguise, spent the time begging in the city. In ten days, I was able to pay my debt. Well, you can imagine how hard it was to settle down to arduous work again at two pounds a week. It was a long fight between pride and money, but I threw up reporting and became a professional beggar. I began to save considerable sums of money. I grew more ambitious. I took a house in the country and eventually married without anyone suspecting me. Only one man knew my secret. Alaska, who keeps that den in Swandham Lane. So that every day I could go there to transform myself. Well, last Monday, I finished for the day. I was dressing in my room, and chancing to look out of the window, I saw my wife. I, I suppose I cried out with surprise and leapt back, but, but she'd seen me. I heard her voice downstairs. Well, not knowing what else to do, I threw on my beggar's disguise, but then I realized that the search of the room would reveal my clothes and betray me. So I, I threw open the window, quickly filled my coat pockets with coppers, and hurled it into the Thames. The other clothes would have followed, but there was a rush of constables up the stairs, and rather to my relief, instead of being identified as Neville Sinclair, I was arrested as his suspected murderer. And in the excitement, you had chance to reopen a cut on your finger made at your home that morning, hence the blood. Why, yes. But how came the letter to your wife? Well, before my arrest, the police left me unobserved for a few moments. I'd just long enough to scrawl a hurried note and give it to the Alaska with my ring. That note only reached her yesterday. Oh, good heavens. What a week she must have spent. Oh, we've been watching that Alaska. He, he must have handed the letter to one of his sailor customers. And he forgot to post it until he was in grave jail. That was it. I don't know that there's anything more for me to say. Except to swear that it will all cease here and now. There must be no more beggar man, Boone. I swear it by the most solemn oaths a man can take. Well, in that case, I think it's probable that no further steps may be taken. Oh, very well. <laughs> Well, Mr. Holmes, I'm sure we're very much indebted to you once more for clearing this matter up. You know, though, I wish I knew how you'll reach your results. I reached this one by sitting upon five pillows and consuming an ounce of shag. And now, my dear Watson, I think that if we drive to Baker Street, we shall just be in time for breakfast. <laughs> The Twisted Lip was one of the Sherlock Holmes stories from the inspired pen of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. My name, my, my real name, is Norman Shelley. My friend Carlton Hobbs played Sherlock Holmes, and I was Dr. Watson. Michael Hardwick wrote our script, 
for this BBC production from London. And may I say I look forward to the pleasure of your company again 